Well, just before we start, and good morning to you all, uh, just some uh, housekeeping items. Uh, be aware of the exit signs around you, and in case of us needing to leave the room, uh, just head out to the exit and head toward the main lobby stairwell that's behind, and just go down and uh, vacate the building. There are restrooms um, on the I Street end of the hallway when you get out to the main area, and um, feel free. Um, also, um, most importantly for the uh, web uh, viewers, uh, we're strongly encouraging your email questions to be sent during the progress of the seminar. Very important that you send them as soon as you're able so that we can have time to take your questions on the air. And the address should be on the bottom of your monitor, S-I-E-R-R-A-R-M at calepa.ca.gov. So with that, we're about to start. And before we do, this is rather unusual in this that we have both a morning and afternoon session. Um, the afternoon session is 1.30 Pacific Daylight Time, so be aware that it's a two-part seminar. So with that, Neil. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our uh, chair seminar today. As um, Peter has mentioned, it's a little different than typical in that we have a morning and afternoon session. Uh, these are related projects that uh, were part of our CalMAX study in Bakersfield uh, is uh, one of our super sites. The uh, two contracts are listed here on the overhead slide, but our principal investigators for these were uh, Professor Ron Cohen and Professor Alan Goldstein. They're both uh, air quality experts in this field. They've done many uh, research for us in the past and field studies. And uh, this one was part of the CalMAX Bakersfield site. Um, as Peter mentioned, uh, we have a split uh, session. The atmosphere and chemistry of San Joaquin Valley will be presented by Professor Cohen this morning. In the afternoon, we'll look into the complexity of atmospheric organics. And there'll be an opportunity for uh, comments and questions after each of the presentations. Um, also notice that I've logged two hours for lunch. And what I'm hoping is people will be able to use that time to check their emails and phone messages and they can get you know, some of their work done and be able to come back for the afternoon session. Both of these, I think, will be very interesting uh, presentations that you won't want to miss. Uh, before we get to the presentations themselves, I'd like to give you a little bit of a background on the air quality study and, and why we chose to do these measurements in the, in the Bakersfield area. Uh, first of all, the air quality in the San Joaquin Valley is very poor. Um, it is an extreme non-attainment classification for both ozone and the PM 2.5 standards. In fact, it's one of uh, two extreme non-attainment areas for ozone in the whole country. In Bakersfield in Kern County in the southern part of the valley, it experiences not only the highest concentrations typically in the valley, but also the a very high amount of exceedances of air quality standards. So it's of concern from a health concerns benefit. Uh, we do special studies every once in a while because we need to get additional measurements that are not typically included with our routine monitoring. Uh, in the first contract, we're looking at ozone and a lot of different photochemistry. They looked at a number of additional VLCs. They looked in detail at oxides of nitrogen. They looked at hydroxyl radicals, other radicals and stuff. So they had a de very detailed uh, chemical speciation analysis there to investigate the photochemistry. In the uh, afternoon uh, session, the contract was focused on organic carbon. And we're interested in this because it's the second largest contributor to PM 2.5 in the on an annual basis in the Bakersfield area. And as you can see by the slide here, it's almost 25% of the PM 2.5. And so as we attack the PM 2.5 problem, it's good to be aware of the atmospheric processes with organic carbon. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is part of the CalMEX uh, field study. It's a $20 million study that was sponsored jointly by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and ARB during the early summer of 2010. Uh, 
and it was uh, looking at the interrelated issues of the, the pollutants involved, not only in air quality, but also in uh, global climate change. And we want to make sure we understand the pollutants and the processes so that we can have a win-win situation as far as improvement of air quality and minimizing climate change. Um, Bakersfield was one of the super sites for the CalMAX study. And uh, they had another super site located in Pasadena in Southern California. They also had uh, a number of aircraft flying aloft, a uh, number of ozone sound balloons being released. They even had an ocean-going vessel that was taking measurements off the coast. So it was, uh, it's a nice study because we were able to look at a number of species and uh, locations that we don't normally get to. Uh, one thing that staff is really looking forward to this fall is the NOAA group is going to be having a, uh, a synthesis report of some of the findings that's supposed to come out in this fall, and we're looking forward to those results. We've got a lot of results, interesting results coming out today, and there's additional analyses that are going on and integrated between the different groups, and so we're looking forward to that synthesis report this fall. Uh, the primary objectives of these contracts were to look at the atmospheric composition and the processes occurring in the southern San Joaquin Valley. And in conjunction with the greater CalMAX study, uh, we're looking to improve our emission inference not only for the pollutants related to the criteria pollutants, but also greenhouse gases. Uh, with the special studies and the extra detailed chemical measurements and measurements aloft, these would be very helpful in improving our air quality modeling efforts. And the results will also be used in the future for our SIP development. Uh, as you probably know, the US EPA in the recent years has reduce both the ozone and the PM 2.5 standards, and so we'll need to develop plans to make sure we attain those. Uh, some of the interesting things out of these studies that uh, struck me were that uh, ozone air quality is poised to rapidly improve in the southern San Joaquin Valley. I was impressed by the importance of the nighttime chemistry in the formation of nitrate aerosols and the uh, dominant influence of secondary organic aerosols to our organic carbon uh, situation. And there's uh, at least a half a dozen papers that have already been published from these two contracts, and there are several more that are coming out in the, the near future. And these are used to advance the air quality science. And also there's ongoing research, not only with the groups that were involved in this study, but also other CalMEX researchers to integrate stuff for, across different um, platforms. So we're really looking forward to results coming out of the CalMEX study. Um, on your handouts or on the web, I've included uh, a list of the different publications that have come out, those that are in process. And there are many other papers beyond those that will be coming out in the near future, too. Uh, this is a list of the different groups that were involved in this study. And I've also included a resource here for you know, future use after the study that you can find out more about the CalMEX. There are a couple other field studies during the summer of uh, 2010 also. There's CalMEX looking at issues of, uh, on the border between California and Mexico. There's a link there that you can investigate more. And we also had the uh, carbonaceous aerosols and radio of effects study here in the Sacramento area looking at uh, the transformation of the Sacramento plume and how that affects air quality of organic carbon, but also uh, radiative effects for climate change. And I don't want to steal too much of Ron Sunday or his time, but I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Ron Cohen. He had his PhD in uh, chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he became a professor there, and he's uh, moved up through the ranks. He's now the director of the Berkeley Atmospheric Science Center. He is also uh, currently an editor for the Open Access Journal Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics. And uh, he's worked with us on several projects in the past, and we're always very interested in his uh, work in atmospheric chemistry, and particularly looking at uh, oxides and nitrogen chemistry. So with that, will you join me in welcoming Professor Cohen? Hey, thank you, Leon, and thank all of you for joining here in the room and on the web. Um, so you see here a slide that uh, start to orient you to what we did in the summer of 2010. Uh, with ARB support, we built a tower and brought electricity to that tower. We had intended to be at one site, and uh, we lost the lease to that site during the course of the setup, so we rapidly re reoriented ourselves to go to a piece of UC property. Uh, so this is on the back of the UC Cooperative Extension field at Kern, Kern County, 
And this is the tower we erected, and we surrounded it with trailers um, and made measurements from the top and also several heights along that tower. Um, for those of you, you know, there's probably none in this audience, but just in case, uh, just to remind you where Bakersfield is and the me meteorology in the region, what we see in the Central Valley is basically down valley flow, air coming in, uh, in the San from the San Francisco Bay Area, going across the passes in the Carquina Strait or through the Altamont Pass at Livermore, splitting and then flowing north and south through the valley. So that by the time you get to Bakersfield, you have air that's basically traveled all down valley. Um, what we did at this site, just to uh, repeat and emphasize some of the things that Leon said, um, the contract that I'm mostly focused on, and I should say that Alan will probably talk about things that he did under both contracts. Uh, the, the first contract, 08, 316, the, the fact that they're both 316 is, I'm told, a coincidence. Uh, the 08 one was a joint one for myself and Alan, and also uh, we supported measurements by four other uh, research groups with the intention that those groups would, uh, over time, bring other resources to allow them to do analysis and that Alan and I would lead the initial analyses of this data set. Uh, we also twisted the arms of various other people and they, Alan was able to uh, get a second uh, ARB contract. Lynn Russell had an ARB contract to work at this site and four other people came to that site with their own support. Um, and with that uh, large team, we were able to do an extremely comprehensive set of measurements at this location. So we had measurements of the winds and of slowly reacting tracers that allow us to think about both about greenhouse gas sources but also about transport in the region. We had uh, an incredibly uh, dense suite of nitrogen oxide and uh, nitrogen measurements allowing us to look at all the different phases of nitrogen oxides, gas, and aerosol. We had a lot of things that tell us about the hydrogen radical chemistry, both direct measurements of OH and HO2 and reaction products of those things. We had uh, measurements of many, many, many different kinds of organics, and you'll see those in Alan's talk. Uh, and we had a lot of uh, information about the inorganic chemistry of the aerosol. Um, you know, as I just told you, the winds are relatively simple. In the daytime, the winds all come from the same direction. When the winds are faster, they come from a little further away. Uh, but basically, they're all coming from the same direction. Uh, and at night, we had a little bit more of a spread. The wind's mostly reversed, coming from the opposite direction at night. Um, just a couple of, of slides to show you the diff some of the different kinds of measurements and what we see. Here's measurements of peroxyacetyl nitrate, or acyl peroxy nitrate pan. You see it's got a background. It increases during the day, sort of characteristic of a photochemical product. Uh, its sister molecule, peroxypropionyl nitrate, has the same kind of behavior. Um, here's another suite. We had uh, measurements of both inorganic and organic acids from Paul Wenberg's group at Caltech. You can see that nitric acid is a strong photochemical product. It goes up quite strongly during the day. Uh, these other organic acids, acetic acid, formic acid, propionic acid, those are things that seem to have both chemical and evaporative sources. You see that they increase at night in indicating they're being released at night into the lower boundary layer. So that's not just photochemistry controlling the organic acids. Okay, so that's, that's the large background. Let me sort of step back a little from CalMEX and give you a broader perspective on what I think is happening to air quality in the United States and then step back. So here's, you know, again, a picture of our site. And now let's take a, a view from space. Uh, this is uh, work we did using the satellite OMI to look at the nitrogen oxide NO2 column over the United States and these units, molecules per square centimeter. And this is what it looked like in summer 2005. And I'll just go back and forth a few times. This is summer 2011. So there's an unbelievable decrease in the, in the NO2 column over the United States. And this is a major driving force for trends. Uh, that what we did to achieve this was to change the catalyst on motor vehicles. The recession contributed a little bit, but primarily this is the tier two catalyst on cars. And that means that the, the organic molecules that are emitted by cars were coming down in proportion roughly. This works out to be about 7% per year decrease in the NO2 column. 
And so that fraction of VOC that are coming from cars are also decreasing at about 7% per year. Um, let me just show you an, an even stronger contrast. If you look on a weekday in 2005, let's just compare that to a weekend in 2011. Right? So if you look on a weekend in 2011, you're now left with the only red spots on the map are Los Angeles and New York City. You know, even the other major cities are now you know, fading into the background. You see Chicago in the center of this map. You see, you see Denver standing out. You see a couple of western power plants. You see the Four Corners power plant uh, has, you know, Las Vegas has disappeared. At the beginning of this record, Las Vegas and Four Corners were about equal. Um, so this is striking. You can start to see, ask questions about what's going on in the background. But I want to focus in here on the San Joaquin Valley. So just to put just a couple more pieces of information, this slide shows you normalized to 2005, the trend in all of these different cities that we, that we looked, 40 different cities. And you see that you know, the average decrease is to 30% uh, to decrease. There's a little bit of spread about that. We think that spread tells you something about the relative uh, contribution of cars and trucks, that cars have decreased the same everywhere and you get different uh, decreases in a different city depending on the contribution of other nitrogen oxide sources. And the power plants are much more variable because that had to do with whether or not they were required to institute controls or not. Um, the other thing you see, uh, and this is all out in a paper on atmospheric chemistry and physics, is that we had stronger decreases over this time period on weekdays on week than on weekends, and that's because uh, there, were, there were also contributing factors from the recession and decrease in truck traffic over this, in this time window. Okay, but where that brings me to thinking about the San Joaquin is we've had this, we've done this incredible experiment. We've, on a relatively short time scale, five or six years, dramatically reduced the emissions from motor vehicles. Uh, so what did that do to ozone in the San Joaquin and how can we think about it? Um, so that's, that's this segment of the talk, and it's, gonna, it's mostly work done by my graduate student, Sally Pusetti, um, and so she's the real architect of this. Um, so here's the background. So here's the median ozone uh, from 1995 to 2010 in three locations. It's basically Stockton, Fresno, and Bakersfield from north, central, and south in the San Joaquin, and you see that uh, in the northern San Joaquin, in the later years of the record, at least more than half the days are not violating the, the uh, state ozone standard. In the central part of the state, it's basically half the days are above and half below uh, at the end of this record. And in the southern San Joaquin, it's maybe a little bit more than half are in violation of the standard. And the question that we were really asking here is, why do we have these trends and what, what, what aspect of those changes over time do we understand? So let me just bring the satellite perspective to this. If I showed you this picture at the beginning of this record, it's hard to tell the difference between the cities because the nitrogen oxide plume, the chemical plume, was basically blanketing the whole valley. At the end of this record, that is no longer the case. At the end of this record, each of these cities is its own individual plume, and it's separable from the adjacent cities. And that's clear in the satellite image. You see here, Shafter is low. Bakersfield is high, downwind Arvin is low again in the NO2. Now that doesn't mean that ozone has the same spatial pattern, but it tells you that the emissions from the city are now localized and concentrated in the city, and we can think about it stewing in its own juices a little bit, separable from the cities around it. Uh, you see something that's a lot like that in Fresno, upwind at Madeira, the concentrations of NO2 are low, higher in Fresno, there's a decrease along the way to part of the way, then some a little spikes along the way south. Uh, less clear in the Stockton to Merced plume, but still something that looks uh, like a plume inseparable from the things around it. Um, so let me just remind you that when we think about surface ozone, the chemical losses of, of ozone aren't important. They're too slow to matter on the time scale of a day. They, they matter when we think about the globe. They matter when we think about the background coming to California. But if you think about the increase in ozone from the morning to the afternoon when we get high ozone, the chemical losses are too slow to matter. So what matters are two things, how fast we're making ozone and how quickly we're diluting it into the background. 
Um, so, and so if you have stagnant air, you slow down the dilution rate. If your chemistry runs faster and you keep the dilution about the same, then on days when the chemistry is running faster, you get more violations of the standard. You make more ozone. Um, so what, what's the experiment that we did over the last 20 years? Over the last 20 years, we didn't change the sunlight. We didn't change the frequency of stagnation. We didn't change temperature. You know, so there are statistical variations. Some years are a little hotter, some years are a little colder. But if you look over the long record, there's no trends in any of those variables. Uh, the nitrogen oxides are changing. We did two experiments. We have a long-term trend, and we have a day of week. And, that, and the organics are changing, and we think there's a yearly trend. There's not much day of week. Um, cause the main sources don't vary with day of week. Cars don't vary as much as trucks with day of week, and cars emit far more VOCs that are ozone relevant than trucks. Um, so, but we don't really know whether there's yearly trends beyond the part that comes from motor vehicles. Um, so, and the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, so five years ago, the, we the weekend weekday difference is a drop of about 50% in nitrogen oxides, and we're decreasing at about 7% per year. So that means three or four years later, on a weekday, you have exactly the same nitrogen oxides that you had on a weekend a few years ago, and you may or may not have changed the important VOC. So you can do that direct comparison of a weekday today with a weekend a few years ago when the NOx is identical, and say, are the statistics of my ozone violations identical or are they different? And that tells you a lot about what's going on in the other parts of the chemistry. So that, that's really a, a key thing thought process that we went through in this analysis is to say, how do we compare this relatively short time period of weekdays today to weekends a couple of years ago when they had exactly the same NOx? Um, so just to remind you, ozone production is free radical catalysis. It starts with sunlight. There's a cycle of chemistry, uh, and it, it's terminated by some reactions. We measured things involved in all of these steps. We measured almost everything involved in the initiation, we measured almost everything involved in chain propagation, and we measured almost everything involved in chain termination. So the experiment really nails this, this piece of the chemistry quite strongly. Um, and we, it's, this is, at least in general and in principle, we understand this chemistry really well. The rate at which you make ozone, which is what's on the y-axis here, P ozone, the production rate of ozone, uh, in some units of molecules per second, PPB per hour, whatever your favorite units are, is a function of nitrogen oxides and sunlight and organics. So if we keep the sunlight constant, as I did in this slide, and we change the organics from low to high, you see that at any given nitrogen oxides, at the, uh, on one end of the curve, at the high nitrogen oxide end, you get b steep increases in the rate of ozone production as you increase organics. On the low nitrogen oxide end, you can change organics all you want. You don't get a change in ozone production rates. Okay, so now let's look, with that background, let's look at the data. Uh, and we sorted the data by temperature because we wanted to understand uh, how temperature played a role in the San Joaquin Valley in the ozone. And we thought it was likely a, an indicator of the key pieces of the organic reactivity. And I'll show you as we go on that that really was the case. But let's just, this is a complicated slide, so let's walk through it slowly. Uh, let's start at Shafter. What you're seeing here, and let's start where it's red, the high temperatures. So this is, on average, 66 days a year had temperatures in this window. They're not, there weren't 66 days in the CalMEX study that have temperatures in that window, but we had measurements, enough measurements to be relevant to that temperature window. Uh, and what you see is as nitrogen oxides decreased, the, the fraction of days, or the per goes, which goes from zero to one, uh, decre that were violating the state standard went from a little bit over three quarters down to about a quarter over this record. It's really a remarkable uh, improvement in air quality at that temperature. Um, and you see solid symbols are weekdays, and open symbols are weekends, and basically you can't tell the difference. They all fall on the same line. It looks like one constant trend. Uh, if you go down downwind, so that's, that's the area that comes into this city. You go down to Bakersfield, there's been some time for chemistry to happen. You see there's a substantial increase in the fraction of days violating the state standard. 
So we start at some initial condition at Shafter. We violate the state standard more frequently at Bakerfield. Again, you see no separation between weekdays and weekends. They all look like they're on the same line. You go further downwind to Arvin, and you see that we're violating the state standard at those temperatures every single day. It's basically unit probability for violating the state standard at Arvin, even if we're starting down here with only one in four days at Shafter. So if you were to, you know, if in an imaginary experiment, if you eliminated all emissions from the city of Bakersfield, three quarters of the violations at Arvin would go away. You know, no matter what was going on in the rest of the valley. So let's start there. But that's only the high temperature story. The medium temperatures, and you know, so this blue is ordinarily cold, and your choices in this San Joaquin Valley are hot and very hot. So in this case, blue is hot. You know, 28 degrees C is hot. We would all be uncomfortable. We'd have our air conditioning on. That's about the same number of days a year, 72 days a year on average instead of 66. Uh, at Shafter, you see something really different. You see that the number of violations is it's much lower, but there's a huge difference in weekday and weekend. The trend over time, decreasing nitrogen oxide, starting in this record at about 8 ppb on the weekends, going down to about you know, four at the end of the record we used for this analysis on the weekends uh, is one line, and the sort of nine, 10 ppb on weekdays decreasing to about five is a different line. So there's, whatever's going on, so this is already sort of a, a key result of this study and interesting. Whatever's going on at these moderate temperatures is distinctly different from what's going on where it's hot, and it's, you know, and it's the organics that must be different because the nitrogen oxides are changing in the same way. The only other thing that's changing is the organics. So that says that at these temperatures and these temperatures, the VOC source for the ozone is not the same stuff. Um, and here it changed because when we change the NOx over time, we get a different result than uh, what, uh, up here when we change the NOx and we all fall on the same line. So in this study, if you go in and the if you go into Shafter at the high temperatures and you pick out NOx today and you go back a few years ago to when NOx was identical, you get exactly the same number of violations of the ozone standard. That doesn't happen uh, when the temperatures are moderate. The same thing is true in Bakersfield. You see clear separation of the open symbols and the closed symbols at the moderate temperatures. Uh, and similarly at Arvin, although not quite as strongly. Okay, so that's as a function of NOx. And it's two different temperatures, weekdays and weekends. So let me just do it as a function of time. And I'll keep and time running the wrong way but here so that it's the same way that you were just looking at that Nox, those Nox curves. From a while ago to today, where today is sort of near the origin. And this is, again, exceedance probabilities of the state ozone standard. Uh, open symbols are weekends. Closed symbols are weekdays. Uh, red is hot, very hot, and blue is moderately hot. And you see a couple things that jump out at you. You see that you start at Shafter, and when it's very hot on the weekends, things get better. You violate the standard less frequently. When it's moderately hot on the weekend, things get worse. Okay, so that's complicated, right? Because most of the time when we would do this analysis, we would lump all that together and we would talk about a weekend effect. So take home message number one is we better sort by temperature all the time because there's more than one thing going on. And if you just look for a weekend effect, those two, two different signed behaviors are likely to cancel and give you the wrong answer. Or they'll give you some answer, but it's not, not really telling you what the weekend effect is. Uh, but you also see that by the end of this record, uh, at these moderate temperatures, there's no difference between weekdays and weekends. Uh, and so that's a strong hint that you're reaching that point where there's a crossover, and if we continue this on to 2012, where we are today, we actually expect weekends to be better than weekdays, even at the moderate temperatures at Shafter. Um, the other thing you can say is this is a direct measure of the benefit of controlling NOx. We know exactly how much NOx goes down on the weekends. We know that at the high temperatures, based on the history of this record, that v the v important VOC aren't changing very much. So a drop in NOx of 30-50%, which is the range that we're doing on the weekends, cuts the number of violations by about a third. So you can, those of you who do cost-benefit analysis can have a direct observation that tells you dollars, you know, however you want to translate the benefit of that reduction, 
to uh, the cost that it takes to reduce the NOx that does it. Uh, we see that at Arvin, over this time, on the weekdays, there's been absolutely no change in the frequency of violation. But on the weekdays, weekends, excuse me, in the last piece of this record, we're starting to see that on the weekends, we're getting a decrease in ozone violations, even at Arvin. So the NOx controls are starting to have their effect at Arvin. Okay. So we wanted to try and give a little bit more mechanistic story to this and tie it back to our sense of how ozone is made in ozone production. So what we did was to say, let's make the assumption that the VOC aren't really changing weekday to weekend, and, and we have lots of observations that support that idea. So let's take averaged over a few years the weekday frequency of violation and the weekend frequency of violation and draw a line connecting them. And then let's put an ozone production curve through that probability. And we made a, in, the, in our paper, you can see the arguments that we do linking the frequency of violation to the production rate, but we think we make a reasonable case that those two things are connected. Uh, so you can draw these curves then. So let's start here at Arvin. At Arvin, as the hints in the data told us, the important VOC have not changed. Over, the, over these years. So essentially, we can draw one set of curves, one curve through these different points. And what you have here, and again, closed symbols are a weekday, open symbols are a weekend. And you're seeing an average over a set of years, 99 to 02, 03 to 06, and 07 to 10. And you see that at the beginning of the record at Arvin, we were in a region of the chemical production curve that was insensitive to changes in NOx. We were right at the peak where ozone production is fastest, and the derivative was near zero. But as we've moved on in time, we're now at a point where weekends are, we're on a steep slope downward, and weekends are a lot better. Uh, you see the same thing in Bakersfield at the highest temperatures. Again, we're seeing that we're in a region that was pretty flat at the beginning of this record, and we're now at a point where there's a steep decrease with respect to decreases in NOx. And then you see at Shafter upwind that you can't draw one curve through all the points. At Shafter, the important organic molecules have changed over time. So we have to draw three different curves, each of those curves corresponding to a different set of NOx conditions and VOC conditions in order to explain the behavior of the frequency of violations over time. So that's the high temperature story. At lower temperatures, you see that we're on a different part of the VOC NOx curve. You see that at the beginning of this record, we were all in the situation at modest temperatures where ozone would increase in response to a decreasing NOx. You see the derivative in the observations. If you look at these black symbols, the solid symbol connected to the open symbol, if you look at Shafter or Bakersfield or Arvin, all of them had more violations as a percentage of the days on the weekend than on a weekday. Uh, but that decreased over time. Percentage violations changed even at the same NOx. Right? So if we look here, look at Bakersfield, look at the open black symbol and the closed red symbol, that's essentially the same nitrogen oxide concentration separated by four years. The important organics had to change for that to happen. There was a clear decrease in important nitrogen oxides at these modest temperatures that are reducing ozone. Um, so that's, but you can see this, if you look at this last green open symbol, all of those green open symbols are starting to reach the point where they're at the peak. So if you continue nitrogen oxide controls, even at these modest temperatures where VOC controls ha have been effective, we're about to have very effective NOx, con NOx controls at all temperatures in the southern San Joaquin. OK, so let's move up the valley now. Let's look at Fresno. Here's the data versus year. You see something very similar, that at the high temperatures, the direction of the weekend effect was to reduce the number of violations. We reduce NOx, so we have fewer violations on the weekend. On the weekdays, it has the opposite sign. So we can't throw all the data in one thing together. Um, I'm sorry, at the modest temperatures. So modest temperatures, look at, look at Madeira. The open symbols are above the closed symbols. Hot temperatures, the open symbols are below the closed symbols. Different sign of the weekend effect depending on temperature. That's also true in Fresno. Uh, also true in Parlier. Uh, we see if you look at the last year at Madeira, there's essentially no weekend effect. So we've re implying that we've reached the peak in the curve. 
and further NOx controls are going to make it better on both at, at all temperatures on weekdays and, uh, and weekends. Uh, in Fresno, we see that we're getting better. The weekends are lower than weekdays and at the hot temperatures, and they're approaching the same probability of a violation at modest temperatures. Uh, at Parlier downwind, uh, at hot temperatures, we clearly have a NOx benefit. We're not quite there, but we're getting close closer than we have been uh, at the end of this record. Um, so we can put that again on these curves where we try and draw a production rate curve that's self-consistent across the years. Uh, and we see that there's been a pretty strong benefit to VOC controls in the, in the central San Joaquin, but that we're also, in every case, we're reaching a point where we're at or past the turnover where NOx controls are going to start to be effective. And that's always true at high temperatures, and we're nearing that point at the modest temperatures. Um, so here we, we do have the other sign. And in the northern San Joaquin, Stockton, uh, Turlock, Merced, uh, at the two upwind locations, Stockton and Turlock, we have already, if on the weekends when NOx decreases, we uh, increase the number of violations consistently at any temperature. Uh, when you get to Merced, that flips. So the, at the downwind site, we, de we have a de at the highest temperatures, we have a decrease in the frequency of ozone violations. Uh, but at the modest temperatures, we're flipped. And on the last year, we're identical. So we're approaching that point, but we haven't crossed it yet. And, uh, and again, here's the production curve. We're, we're much further out to the high VOC regime in, in the northern San Joaquin. And it's only Merced where we're really right at the peak and turning over. Turlock on a weekend is at the peak, but on a weekday is not there yet. So depending on where you are, you get a really different story here. So trying to lump them all together, uh, we need to take care. But the key variables here are temperature, NOx, and then the frequency of ozone violations allows you to put yourself on, on a curve that tells you what's been happening to the total VOC reactivity over this time window. Okay, so I think our key result here is that temperature is a major controlling variable that we need to think about carefully, that throughout the valley we're approaching that point where NOx controls are going to be effective, and aggressive pursuit of NOx controls will be effective almost everywhere in this valley. Uh, that's likely true in every U.S. city, but um, it, it's certainly true at the highest temperatures throughout the valley. When it's hot, where we have the most ozone violations, NOx controls will be immediately effective. Um, but that's not to say that what we've done to this point has not been extremely effective. The VOC controls we've implemented have been extremely effective, especially in the northern and central San Joaquin, and especially at the modest temperatures. So there's, the, the, this, the, both things are important and may very well continue to be important. Um, Okay, but this does raise a question. So at these high temperatures, we clearly have some source of organics, and there's no hint that those organics have been controlled. So in the last few minutes on this part of my talk, I want to just give you a few ideas for how we're approaching trying to figure out what those are. Um, and so here's the CalMEX data. It's, the data is temperature, uh, the concentration of formic acid as one sort of kind of molecule, and the concentration of orthoxylene as an automobile-related molecule. And if we just plot orthoxylene versus temperature, there's no relationship. This molecule is just emitted, and it's emitted in proportion to the amount of people drive, and the, the concentration goes as the driving and the boundary layer height. Nothing interesting there from the point of view of temperature. Here's formic acid. This one is not subtle. This one is exponential in temperature. Um, so what we did was we tried to we went through and we fit a curve, a temperature-dependent curve to every single molecule that we measured, and then we aggregated them by functional group. And so that's what I'm going to show you here. And we normalized to how important the reaction with OH is. So how fast does that molecule propagate the free radical chain? So these are all the same units. This is a, a lifetime of OH with respect to that molecule of one per second is the molecule normalization here. The total reactivity that we measure is you add all these up. And so this is, this is, these are all now weighted appropriately to think about the rate of the chemistry. 
And what you see is when it's cold, the, by far the dominant source of reactivity are uh, alk anthropogenic VOCs that are temperature independent and carbon monoxide. And that term doesn't vary with temperature. So when it's cold, right, these two things are adding up to about 1.8. And you, know, you can add the sum of these. They may be similar. But they're not in large excess of that number. So when it's cold, the cars and trucks are a lot, a lot of the reactivity. On the other hand, when it's hot, we have a totally different story because these acids, small alcohols, um, and acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is the top one over here. Small alcohols is second, and formaldehyde is third. When it's hot, those things far and away are in excess of anything that comes from cars and trucks. They're emitted by some different process. They're exponential in temperature. Uh, and they, they change from being not so important to the whole story. Uh, there are some alkanes that have a, an exponential temperature dependence. The alkanes are more slowly reacting, so they don't end up being as important. The biogenics, uh, you know, at the end, at 45C, if we, if we get the, on those days that you get there, the biogenic emissions are equal to the, the, either the cars and trucks or CO, you know, so they're half of that, that term. Um, so that, this is an interesting thing to think about. It's clear that something exponential in temperature is going on. And I, I would say, at least, I don't understand this well enough to say that we can regulate, we can build a strategy to reduce those. Because I, th I don't have a clear enough understanding where they come from. So the time between today, figuring that out, writing a regulation, and implementing it, looks to me as sort of an outside observer a long time. Whereas if you reduce nitrogen oxides, you know today what the benefit is, and you can measure them immediately. So you could write a regulation whose effect you would know absolutely. Um, OK. So, but the other interesting thing here is we had a measure of the total reactivity. So we know what, what we didn't measure, in a sense. So if we come down here to the lowest temperatures, the sum, this yellow is, the su is what I just showed you. It just adds up all those molecules and says how reactive they were. And if you're 20, 25C, uh, the budget is closed. We measured everything that's important to the reaction of OH. So we have, we have it right at that point. We know what's driving the photochemistry. We measured all the important players, and they add up to the total. As it gets hotter and hotter, the gap grows. So even though I showed you that contributing out here at 35, 45C, alcohols um, and aldehydes are the dominant source of the reactivity, we're only measuring half of whatever it is that's important. So that's the other piece that sort of we have to think about as we try and reduce the reactivity. If we're going to implement a VOC control, we need to implement a control that's effective on the half of the molecules whose names we don't know. That's hard. Um, so, the, so this is a specific to the southern San Joaquin story, because that's where we made these measurements at Bakersfield. Uh, I showed you that this is less, in general, this exponential story of reactivity is less true as you go north. Um, but what we know is that from the Bakersfield study, the VOC that are most important at high temperatures are small aldehydes and alcohols, and some other stuff whose name we don't know. Um, we, there are people who've talked about those molecules as major emissions from silage. We don't know that that's where these particular alcohols and aldehydes are coming from, one way or the other. Um, and this is what I just said. I don't think we know where they come from. And so that leads me to think that we better think pretty hard about NOx controls while in parallel we figure out where those molecules come from. OK. All right. So that's what I wanted to say about chemistry. Uh, I want to switch gears now and talk about uh, aerosol. Uh, for a while now, we've been thinking about these molecules, the organic nitrates. They look like nitric acid, but replace the hydrogen with some organic species. Uh, they're typically extremely hard to measure, because the interesting organic species are ones that are hydro have a hydroxy group. They're multifunctional. They, you, they get lost on the input to a chromatography column. Or you have to heat your column enough that the, the NO2 group falls off at the end. So even if you measure the molecule, even if the molecule gets into your column, when it comes out the end of your column, it has some other name. You don't know what it is. Um, 
and the, the question that really got me going here was, okay, so in a, we've done this great experiment at reducing nitrogen oxides. Uh, has it had any effect on the amount of aerosol in the atmosphere? And it should have changed the amount of OH in the atmosphere by a dramatic amount. It's changed the amount of NOx in the atmosphere by a dramatic amount. So we should be able to observe some consequence of that. And the question is, what would that observable be? And I, I don't entirely have the answer to what that observable will be, but we thought hard about you know, st step one, which was, is there any direct influence of the nitrogen oxides on the secondary organic aerosol? So uh, this comes from a paper that a grad student of mine, Drew Rollins, who's now working at NOAA, wrote that appeared in Science uh, in September, and then another one that's at JGR and it's in review. And our idea starts here. Let's do some chemistry where we make these organic nitrates. If we start with some organic molecule in the daytime, we react with OH in the presence of NO, we make an organic nitrate. Uh, modest yields, the small ones very low, we get up to maybe 30%. If we do it at night with the NO3 radical, we get yields that are 50% up to 80%. So reaction per reaction, this is a much more efficient route to making these molecules. Uh, in most cases, in, in both cases with these sort of starting materials, we make a molecule that's too high a vapor pressure to be important to the aerosol. So those molecules have to hang around, react a second time in order to go into the aerosol. Um, but they're in some gas liquid equilibrium with the condensed phase. Uh, and if we do a second reaction, then their vapor pressures drop enough for in the language of the, our aerosol friends, C star, that tells you the gas aerosol equilibrium constant in some sense. Uh, C star drops from 100 micrograms per cubic meter, which we never see or almost never see, to 0.1 microgram per cubic meter, which we often exceed. So on the second reaction, we take molecules that were by and large in the gas phase and we put them all in the aerosol phase if that happens. Uh, the other thing that we know happens is that these molecules can react with water. Some of them hydrolyze or, or in the presence of water we do a nitrate sulfate substitution uh, creating an organosulfate out of the organonitrate keeping that then that molecule's vapor pressure stay, also stays very low and its water solubility stays high so it never comes back out of the aerosol. Okay, so we made two measurements. Uh, this was the first time we did this in the field. We made a measurement of the aerosol organic nitrate. So the sum total of all molecules that were both organic and had an ONO2 functional group on them. We did that in near real time. We also measured the gas plus particle so we can calculate the partitioning of those molecules because we know the total and we know the aerosol fraction. Okay, so Here's how we did it. The details are in this paper. I won't uh, bore you with that today. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards online, offline. Uh, we know that absolutely and cleanly we uniquely see organic air nitrate aerosol. There's no nitric acid interference. There's no in, in this measurement. It's inorganic nitrate we've been able to show we detect with essentially zero efficiency even when it's in excess by a factor of 100. So it's just not important. Um, and we did this in a couple different places on the tower. Uh, we were uh, focused in particular on a direct comparison with Lynn Russell's AMS and with her infrared measurements of uh, the organic nitrate functional groups to get a sense of how different approaches to getting at the same answer uh, work out in the field. Um, so here's the first result. If we look at the, the aerosol organic nitrates uh, compared to the total, there, there's a lot of scatter, but the basic story is that 20% of the organic nitrates are in the aerosol. So that, you know, that's an interesting number. That tells you something about their vapor pressure. Uh, but it's this slide that tells us something about the chemistry. So let me, let me walk you through this. Let's start at the top. The top is our measurement of the particle organic nitrate. So something like 1 to 2 micrograms per cubic I'm sorry, 0.1 to 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter are particle organic nitrate. Uh, and that number dramatically increases right after sunset. You're, so that's the, the top trace is the organic nitrate mass, and that's just the NO3 group, doesn't include the organic part. Uh, and the bottom is time, and the yellow region is when the sun is out, and the blue region is when it's dark. And you see this steep increase at night, 
that steep increase at night is directly correlated with the amount of NO3 around, or the rate at which we're producing NO3 from the reaction with NO2 plus ozone. Uh, and you see in the middle, in green, is the amount of organic aerosol. It was, you know, in an average sense, three to four micrograms per cubic meter. So just the, the nitrate fraction of this alone is, is not insignificant compared to the total. Remember, this is organic nitrate. It's not, not the inorganic fraction. Um, and then here's that ratio. So the, the NO3 component of this organic aerosol is something like 4.5% at midnight. Uh, the sun comes up and it decreases down to about 2%. And then in about four hours, there's a steep increase from about 2% up to 5%. So the organic, fraction, the organic nitrate fraction of the aerosol is strongly affected by nighttime chemistry. Uh, now let's put some reasonable organic molecule on this NO3. Right? In order to get the vapor pressure low enough, we, it's not methyl nitrate. That's, that has an infinite vapor pressure. So we need to hang a relatively heavy organic substituent off the NO3 in order to be, for it to be condensable. And that means something that's got a molecular weight of 200 to 300. Depending on what you choose, that means a third to 40% of the nighttime growth is associated with this NO3 chemistry. If you allow that the NO3 chemistry has some fragmentation so that it initiates formation of some other or it has some other chemistry that causes some other molecules to go into the gas phase, you might say that everything that happens at night is NO3 initiated. Um, so that's a pretty important term to the chemistry. Um, and then so we said, okay, so given this data set where we had this beautiful extensive suite of the organics, what else could we learn about where this aerosol organic nitrate is coming from. And what we realized was that we had this, you know, we had, if, if you imagine that these symbols on this figure are all one color, we had something that looked like it had an upper limit, but it had a lot of scatter. And then we looked at the lifetime of NO3 as one variable that might explain that scatter, and found when the lifetime of NO3 was very long, so when the organics in the atmosphere aren't very reactive to NO3, the correlation is much, much better. And when the lifetime is very short, the correlation was lousy. And that brought us back to that initial point that I told you, that uh, if you, the first generation NO3 chemistry doesn't make stuff that's condensable, it makes molecules whose vapor pressure is too high. But those are the most reactive molecules. So if we have a lot of unreacted parent organic material around, and this is at night, so it's, we're talking about stuff with double bonds. If there's a lot of that stuff around, you don't make any organic aerosol from the NO3 chemistry. On the other hand, when you don't have very much of that around, you know, and we sort of, by implication, and for you have a lot of the daughters, relatively speaking, you have time for the NO3, or you're not out competing the NO3 for these high vapor pressure stuff, so you do low vapor pressure chemistry and push stuff on into the aerosol phase. Um, so it's an odd thing. When you have a lot of the source, you don't make the aerosol. When you have a lot of the primary source. So it's really second generation chemistry that gets you into the aerosol here, and that's an important piece of the analysis. Um, wrong way. So this just says the same, s something similar. Here's a typical molecule, limonene. It's got two double bonds. It's got, at the first step, we make relatively little condensable material only sort of 10% at that step. Um, and it varies depending on which of those two double bonds we ha attack. Uh, in the second generation, we make a lot more aerosol per unit molecule. So then we went and we looked, and we looked night by night using all the organic molecule measurements at the site. And we said, OK, so we have this loose definition of not very reactive atmosphere or a very reactive atmosphere, what are the molecules that were around? That, so what organics are contributing to this SOA? Uh, and you see it's a different story than the daytime. In the daytime, we had the small aldehydes and alcohols are the main ozone story. Uh, the nighttime chemistry is all driven by biogenics. Uh, limonene is sort of a quarter to a third. Uh, other monoterpenes get, get you going. Uh, when, the, when it's highly reactive, there's a lot of this primary limonene and other monoterpenes. Those are much less important when it's slowly reacting. 
So that's a consistent story that when we have a lot of primary biogenics, the, the vapor pressure of the reactants for NO3 is too high to make aerosol. Uh, we were able to put that in a model and show that depending on the limonene concentration and how you, the time works out, that you can get these sort of ridges that at high limonene, the nitrate production rate is too slow to make aeros the aerosol production rate is slow and that there's in much the same way as in the ozone chemistry you can get a ridge line where the right amount of organic material optimizes the aerosol production too much and you make all non-condensable species too little you don't have enough source material okay so our result here is that NO3 chemistry is perhaps the primary source of organic aerosol in the Central Valley um, it's clear, however you look at it, that this nighttime NO3 chemistry is a major source of the aerosol. Um, and that brings us back to this question of, so what should have happened over time? And I, I don't have a clear answer for you on that. It could be that what we have is a choice. We have these molecules. No matter what happens, they react. No matter what happens, their vapor pressure becomes low and they go into the aerosol. And the only question is which atmospheric actor does, drives that chemistry. Or it could be that it's all NO3, and since we're reducing the NO3 over time at something like 7% per year, proportional to the NO2 decrease, that we should have had a dramatic decrease in secondary organic aerosol. I don't think we have the historical measurements to answer that question, but I think going forward it's one that can drive our thinking about how to design experiments and how to assess what's going on. And it's clearly one that we should be thinking about as we go on, is what, is, what are other chemical drivers, or is, all, is it only the sources? Um, so, and you know, this bring, it could be, if we understood this better, that the NOx reductions that will be clearly so good for ozone will have substantial aerosol co-benefit. I don't know that we, we don't know that today, but that's clearly a question that we should be trying to address because that possibility would drive us even more to thinking about that, the NOx reductions uh, to clean up the, the San Joaquin. So, what I tried to do today was give you two threads that give you just a taste of what we've begun to learn from this really incredibly beautiful data set that we collected at the San Joaquin Valley. The data, the data set is publicly available. If you go, come to my website, you'll be able to get access to send us an email. Uh, there's lots of other things to think about. Uh, Alan Goldstein will tell you about some of them this afternoon. And I'll take your questions now. And I, I thank you for your attention. Um, hi, this is Larry Larson. I work in planning and technical support. Um, one of the things that I've been looking at and considering with respect to the, the results that you report in your paper and that you've uh, put forward today uh, has to do with um, the, the existence of carryover in large amounts from one day to the next. And in particular, that's one of the things I'm pondering as a potential explanation of both the speciation in the high temperature uh, um, uh, graphs that you put together with respect to the ozone uh, formation and the question about the, um, the mass of organics that may not have an explanation for a source of them directly, especially the formaldehydes, acetaldehydes, uh, um, small alcohols, that kind of thing, and its relationship to temperature, in that when, when we have high temperature in the valley and a capping inversion, that tends to be associated with both the highest temperatures and stagnation and carryover from one day to the next, in fact, multiple days of carryover and accumulation. And I'm wondering if really what we're looking at isn't necessarily an uninventoried source but might instead be the association of accumulative reactant, reactant products um, that happen under high temperature uh, conditions relative to the lower temperature conditions, which are less associated with multi-day carryover and capping inversions. OK, so the question is, as I understand it, is, is the VOC sort of a remnant of yesterday? yesterday's oxidation or is it new stuff every day 
So the, the stuff I find most telling about it is that the frequency of inversion hasn't changed over the record, I don't, I don't believe. And so we do see that we're getting differences in chemistry over time. So that, that part of the story, I think, is insensitive to what we assume about the carryover. Um, if you're going to have things that are important to ozone production, I think they can't be things that are very long lived. And so the, your memory of yesterday, of yesterday's formaldehyde, is extremely low. Because the formaldehyde lifetime under these conditions is maybe four hours. So at sunset, there's almost none of yesterday's formaldehyde. So now we need a fast reacting precursor of yesterday's formaldehyde that wasn't fast reacting yesterday. And I think you start to box yourself into finding molecules whose lifetimes are, you, know, you can't really find that many molecules whose lifetimes are that magic. So I think it's unlikely, but it could be. I don't, I don't know of the molecule. I don't see any, we don't see clear evidence that a formaldehyde source is behaving that way, but it would be great to go into this data set and look at the accumulation on those days where we had a stagnation event and look at the accumulation of formaldehyde precursors and ask that question more directly. And if I just suggest a follow on, when, when we look at those surface measurements are not relevant in particular, because especially the surface rel uh, data, apart from the high convective mixing central portion of the day, doesn't represent the mixture aloft in the ozone forming bulk of the stuff. Yeah. So that, that, that's a, a so, so, so for just that reason, we only look at the high convective mixing part of the day in our analysis. So that where the chemistry is focused on when the boundary layer and the full vertical is all uniform. Um, this is Sylvia Vanderspeck. I'm in um, the Planning and Technical Support Division. And actually, Larry brought up a good point, and I was thinking, you know, we do have some areas in the San Joaquin Valley when you're looking at daily air quality in which there is no variations. The values get high, and they kind of stay high for very uh, long days. Kind of, you know, Arvin, there's some, I think, Miraco, there's some downwind areas. And so how, what do you think is... Um, how do you think this relates to that phenomenon? So I, don't th I think that those, what you have there is it's hot, and you have some huge VOC source. And so but the temperatures are going down at night. Is this when you look at like a diurnal pattern, they seem to stay I, at a relatively... Well, I, what, what, what we think matters is the, is the, no is the noontime temperatures. It doesn't matter how cold it gets at night. What matters is how hot it is at noon or 2 in the afternoon. Uh, I'm Ash. Um, good morning. I, I'm curious about something um, that occurs to me. When you're talking about these days that have super high temperature and moderately high temperature, um, there are other days of the week that we we do manufacture ozone, and there may be some point, particularly looking at those days, and those days are going to become important to us because we're reducing eight-hour ozone and various other metrics. So we're reducing the standards. At some point, those days, which probably are half the year to more than half the year, are going to become important to us. Is it likely that we're going to find a third or a fourth uh, temperature-dependent uh, ozone and VOC chemistry in, in those days? So you know, we looked at, if you recall, you know, at yeah, in this region, the, the high temperature days are something like 66 a year, the moderate are 72 a year. We looked in the ozone season at the other days. It's maybe another third of the days are cooler than that. And you know, following this trend, red to blue, the percent of days in violation is much lower in just the, all the sorts of ways that you might expect. So we didn't see anything that taught us anything new by looking at those low temperature days. The number of violations wasn't zero. You know, um, but the basic outline of the chemical part of the story stands up. You know, there, are, there are people who want to you know, talk about the limiting case where we could actually get to zero violations and then the number of violations that have to do with the stratospheric intrusion or transport from some other continent. And if we get to such point where the ones we're creating, you know, look here between where we are in Shafter and where we are in Arvin, if we stop creating you know, more than half the violations in, in a 50-mile radius with emissions in that 50-mile radius, then I think it makes sense to start worrying about the international ones. 
But until that point, you know, all of the problem is local. Steve Gouget, uh, Planning and Technical Support. Did you look at the back trajectories on the high temperature days versus moderate temperature? And did you see a different source region? Our, our look at this says that the, the, the wind flow is basically the same all the time. All that varies a little bit is the speed. But we don't see any particular difference. And it, you know, it could be that someone who's a more sophisticated meteorologist would find one and show that the winds shift. But we don't, we don't think that's the main story here. And in the, in the six-week experiment we did it, uh, between Bakersfield and Arvin at that site, we didn't see anything that would support temperature and wind direction had a strong correlation. I'm Larry Larson once again. I, on a different topic, uh, one of the things that was noticed in the uh, SCOS 97 uh, field study in the Los Angeles area, all, they, they were doing uh, measurements on only selected days, so they were high, expected to be high ozone days, so we don't have the moderate day comparison. But from the ozone sons that were done, one of the things that seems to show up plainly is about half of the ozone measured today was already in the mixing, previous day's mixing layer up to about 1,500 meters from the day before. So at 4, at 4 a.m. kind of uh, ozone son, the integrated ozone up to about 1,500 meters was half of the next day's maximum hour at 2 p.m. ozone sond that already existed. In the San Joaquin Valley, what seems to be the case is that that percentage is yet higher. Uh, maybe as much as 70% of the ozone in the column today already existed at 4 a.m. that morning. And that's, that is uh, something that's been knocking around in my thoughts and sharing with a bunch of people around here to try and get a sense of what that does with respect to the influence of fresh emissions put into that kind of background scenario and how that changes what we see from the ozone smog chamber lab experiments which rarely put fresh emissions into a previous context uh, that especially was uh, one of the things we pointed to in our weekday weekend research here from stuff published, well, that we put online and uh, okay. developed in our work. So that question is a curiosity for me and how we, how we look at the chemistry of new emissions into an existing context. Yeah, so I'll, let me say two things about it. I think that you're exactly right. I think the way you think about this is the daily production mixing into whatever background you, want it, you have. What we don't know about those high layers is the fraction of mixing out the top compared to the input at the bottom. So when you mix the layer down as, as it, the day heats, the relative fraction that goes out that day so that we can talk about a lifetime of the whole boundary layer sensibly is, a, is an important question. I think that that said, you know, so that's, that's exactly where we start. You have chemical production and you have dilution. And if that dilution is into some background that's different today than yesterday, then that really matters. That said, I don't think we would see the weekend, weekday results we have to be as robust as they are if the Friday, if the sign of, of this on Friday dominated whatever you see on Saturday, right? If the high weekend knocks, high weekday knocks was driving all the chemistry and everything you saw on Saturday was a reflection of Friday, which it would be if it was, the story was three quarters as you argue, you wouldn't, say, you wouldn't see the weekend effects of knocks in anywhere near as strong as we see them. They would be wiped out. Saturday would look like Friday, exactly. Yeah, with respect to that question, one of the things that seems to be a key component of whatever weekend effect we see, and that was looked at both in the Bay Area, San Joaquin Valley, and the South Coast when we were doing our earlier work, that at that time, this was back in the late 90s, no, late 90s? Scotia was 97. Well, our weekday weekend effect study was in the mid-2000s, I think, something like that. That sounds about right. Anyway, um, one of the things that seemed clear 
is that about half of the weekend effect at least that you see is focused on destruction of ozone by fresh NOx emissions at the surface. So it's not a full mixing capacity, but it's actually local. So our local not, uh, ozone measurements are surface-based measurements, and that's where most of our NOx so emissions come from in traffic. And about half the weekend effect seems to be simply destruction at the surface, where we measure things. So if you're talking about eight-hour averages, I'll buy that story. If you're talking about you know, afternoon exceedances, which is where we focus, I don't believe that that's relevant. But it's it's the, the, the it's NO2 concentration is, on is, a, is a part in 80 of the ozone, so there's, the titration is not possible. No, we, we, it, don't it any, we don't see any. We don't see that. But we do see, you know, the effect you're talking. I'm not. Don't let me. Don't let me wrong. The effect you're talking about is important. If you look at the NO2 column, the NO2 column on Saturday is higher than Sunday, and the the memory of yesterday in the system is an important term. But I don't believe that it's dominant. Uh, have you looked at our published work online I have. on that part? Then, yeah. then I'd like to talk with you about it later. This looks like we didn't get any uh, questions off the web. So unless there's any more comments or questions, that will conclude our morning session. I want to thank Professor Cohen for his presentation. <laughs> and I'd also like to remind everybody, uh, our afternoon session will start at 1.30 Pacific Daylight Time. And uh, I know Professor Goldstein has a very good presentation coming, so please come back for that. Try to get your work done during your lunch hour and come back and visit us again. Thank you. Sure.